Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the cathedral. My name is Peter Wall. I have the privilege of being the interim dean in this place, and I want to say that it is an honor to welcome you all here tonight. We gather on the ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit, who have shepherded and tended this land for thousands of years. We take upon ourselves the responsibility of respect and reconciliation and peace as we respect these lands. This cathedral's been here for a long time. And like all cathedrals, it is a place of pilgrimage, of beauty, of art. It is a place that welcomes people every day to look at beautiful stained glass, to look at magnificent wood and stone, and particularly in this place to look at stupendous organ cases that surround you. And like all cathedrals, it is a place that highly values music and the arts. And tonight we are very, very privileged to both welcome a new consul in our midst, a very generous gift of the Farah family in memory of a great priest in this diocese, Canon Shafiq Farah, and to welcome our good friend, former staff member, and a pretty talented guy you might hear in the moments to come, <laughs> Mr. David Briggs. In all the many years that this cathedral has been a beacon of hope and promise to this community, in all the years and the many ways in which it welcomes people in here day by day and week by week, it is for us a real privilege tonight to welcome you to this place, to be uplifted by wonderful music, to relax and to spend some time in peace in this building, to appreciate the artistry and crafts, craftspersonship of those who can create things like this. There are a lot of buttons, you'll notice. There are a lot of buttons. And it's a beautiful, beautiful addition to this cathedral. And I want to thank not only those who donated the funds for it, but those who made it as well. And some of them are here tonight. And we thank them for their care and their uh, devotion to this place that they worked so hard over a long time to make it a perfect piece for our organ. And And so it is a great privilege for me on behalf of all of us at, at the cathedral, particularly on behalf of Tom Bell, our director of music, to welcome not only David, but to welcome all of you, to invite you to sit back, to maybe say a prayer, who knows, to be lifted up out of yourselves by this wonderful gift of music. Thank you for being here. Thank you for David. Thank you, David. The evening is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, live music is back. How marvelous to see you all in, in this wonderful space. Thank you for coming this evening and supporting this great initiative. This is amazing. And uh, you, you should be very, very proud. Uh, it's, I spent probably five of my very happiest years in Toronto between 2012 and 17. I love this space, I love the people here, uh, and I really fell in love with this organ. But you know, in the old days, it was a matter of kind of navigating around, uh, well, a bit like dodgems. You kind of have to steer around the problems. But now everything works, and it's, uh, it's absolutely glorious to have achieved the first stage of the restoration of this great organ. I said to Tom, the, uh, the music director here yesterday, how great it is to have a Mercedes dashboard now. <laughs> um, with, uh, you know, air conditioning, all the gadgets, 
In fact, we ha even have amazing things like sostenuto pistons I can show you. So if I play this chord with a certain preset selected, the organ will play itself. It also has a replay system, so you can play a complete service and put it into the iPad uh, and then go and have coffee. <laughs> but I thought it was absolutely marvelous that the, uh, this iPad that controls the replay <laughs> is in the, the uh, custody of the dean and not of the organist. It was kind of <laughs> intriguing. So I'm going to start this evening with um, uh, the William Walton Prelude and Fugue, The Spitfire, 1942. He wrote it for this amazing movie, The First of the Few. It's all about the history of that great aircraft and specifically about uh, R.J. Mitchell, who was the primary designer. Mr. Mitchell, who was played by Devin, David Niven in the movie, um, unfortunately became quite ill at the end of the Spitfire project and uh, the, the, there's a section near the end of this uh, fugue which is sort of, I think, representative of, uh, of, of, uh, of what happened to R.G. Mitchell on the, in the movie. Uh, but it's a fantastic piece, William Walton, uh, very, very British, this great tune at the beginning, and then a really incredible fugue, uh, which is um, very athletic. And when I was here, I signed up for a Good Life Gym now I play the William Walton fugue instead. So <clears throat> uh, I did meet, I never met William Walton, but I did meet his widow, Lady Susanna Walton. She came to the Three Choirs Festival when I was organist at Gloucester and uh, we performed Belshazzar's Feast. She was an extraordinary lady. She seemed to have a hat which consisted of a, of a, of a tree on her head. It was, she was from Buenos Aires, extremely exotic personality. And uh, in the um, obituary of Lady Susanna Wal Walton, there's a great story. You know, they moved to Ischia, this beautiful island off the coast of, of Italy. <coughs> and uh, they started, they created this amazing garden. Uh, but she really didn't want her husband to retire. Uh, he, she made sure that he was at the desk every morning in the, com in the composition hut at 10 a.m. Anyway, William Walton had this great idea of um, talking to, with one of his students, and apparently one day, the student arrived at the hut at 9.59, William Walton trundled down, opened the door, shut the door, started playing some Walton-esque chords on the piano. Meanwhile, the student took over on the piano, still playing the same sort of chords, and uh, William, 10.15 a.m., climbed out of the window and went to the local bar. Very good.
you can just sense, can't you, the incredible energy of that aircraft hurling its way around the skies. Um, now, by way of complete contrast, Sem Debussy from 1890, originally a piano piece, of course sounds much more beautiful on the organ. <laughs> um, unfortunately, Mr. Debussy never composed a single note of organ music. Actually, there is one piece. He wrote it when he was 16. It's a fugue in G minor in the style of Sue Bach. And I don't mean Sue as in Susan, I mean Sue as in under. And uh, it really sounds like it was a student piece, probably written after a lot too much absinthe uh, <coughs> up in the uh, Montmartre area the night before. But Claire de Lune, uh, stunningly beautiful piece, and I put it down to show the utterly delicious quiet stops on this organ, some of which date you know, from the, eight, from the 1850s, the stuff at the back. Um, a lot from 1936, the Cassavant uh, uh, pipework from that area. But it's, it's one of the things I do remember about this organ is that the beautiful blend of all the soft strings and the flutes, um, especially lovely underneath the choir, of course. So here's Claire de Lune of Claude Achille Debussy, followed by the Hungarian march number one, G minor, by Johannes Brahms. Brahms did write for the organ, um, particularly at the end of his life, he wrote a set of, of uh, stunningly beautiful 11 chorale preludes on his deathbed. It was his kind of homage to Bach and I suppose coming to terms with his mortality. <coughs> um, but the, um, the, the Hungarian march is uh, something completely different and uh, as you'll hear, full of vivacity.
Thank you so much. Well, now we moved into the, um, the very mysterious world of the damnation of Faust of Hector Berlioz. Amazing music from the 1850s, about the same age as, as the, the back organ. And, um, you know, the whole organ was at the back until I think 1890, when, because the, the services, the offices, and the, I guess primarily the Eucharist moved to the front <clears throat> of the cathedral and they decided they wanted to move the choir to the front. So Warren, the organ builders, moved the organ to the front here, just behind some, I think, quite sort of ordinary metal pipes. And it always amazes me that these cases that you see here today, which are magnificent, although obviously ripe for restoration and gold leaf and flood lighting and all those beautiful things. Um, they, they dated from 1916 in the middle of World War I, just quite an incredible thought. And then a huge rebuild here in 1936. The last time the organ really received any major attention was <clears throat> 1966, when I was four years old. So it's very nice now that we have this uh, Mercedes-Benz dashboard, which is such an improvement and it's so much easier to control the instrument. But we do need, um, in the next few years, a full engine restoration, new suspension, new tires, and quite a lot of bodywork. Um, but it's not for a while yet, but it, that's a dream. Can you imagine it? It would be absolutely, I can just see it, with gold leaf on the front, beautifully lit, whole cathedral air conditioned, repainted. <clears throat> Maybe they should appoint me to be the new dean. Just kidding. <clears throat> so here's the damnation of Faust, the menu, menuet des folles. It's all about um, strange little creatures coming in and out of the soil, like gargoyles and, you know, little um, people uh, with three nostrils and pointed ears and sparkling green eyes. A bit like people from New Jersey. Oh, sorry. Is there anybody here from New Jersey? Great. I got away with it.
That music, I always think, is so totally off the wall. I don't know what illegal substances he'd been studying, uh, partaking in, rather. It's wonderful to come back to Toronto, and um, it's one of the things you remember. I remember standing on the corner of Adelaide and Church and hearing the cars going over the subway tracks. That wonderful kind of, that's Toronto for you. And uh, I have to say that you're obviously all extremely proud that today, <clears throat> even more than six years ago, there is even more construction. <laughs> oh. oh my goodness. Um, so we c come now to, um, it's one of my favorite pieces of all time really, the, the Liebestod from Tristan and Isolde and uh, Richard Wagner, of course, he, a complete master of the orchestra, uh, very, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, ravishingly beautiful harmonies. And the trick here, ladies and gentlemen, is really to get it so that you control the organ so you can't really hear any stops going on and off. A bit like a pilot coming into YYZ, uh, YYZ in Canadian. So you, you descend from 30,000 feet and there are no bumps. Never are you above the glide slope and never you, are you um, underneath it. And this has been really facilitated and really aided a lot on this new console. The right hand pedal is called a general crescendo. It has 60 stages and you can set it up. It took about half an hour yesterday <clears throat> so that you can actually calibrate the organ so that you can dovetail the stops so you can't really hear any gaps. So that's coming into Pearson. Coming into the island, of course, is quite another story. Uh, don't even go there. And uh, not literally. I, I, I rather like turbulence myself.
Thank you so much. So we now come to uh, 1909, Maurice Ravel, La Valse, originally a piano piece. He orchestrated it about 10 years later. He was kind of obsessed by the waltz, was Ravel. His mother loved the waltz, and uh, during World War I, his mother died. So he orchestrated it. It's, this piece is really, I mean, it's one of the kernel pieces, I suppose, of the 20th century orchestral repertoire. Just wonderful. It's actually kind of a little bit about the disintegration of the waltz. It sort of starts off um, as you would expect, and then it, it sort of goes through all sorts of kaleidoscopic permutations. It's wildly exciting, and uh, I think it sounds, sounds incredible on this organ. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to just take a 10-minute breather. Um, do please feel free to come and look at this beautiful work of art. Uh, it's, it's really quite something. I love the way that all the, the, uh, the woodwork has been made to match the existing woodwork in the choir. It's, uh, it's really, really very beautiful. So do come up the stairs and, and take a good look. Um, about 10 minutes and then I'll come improvise um, for you to round off the concert. So here is Ravel Lavals.
ladies and gentlemen, we're going we're to start the second half in a few seconds. If you'd like to take your seats, that'd be lovely. So do take your seats. We'll, we'll start just in a few seconds. We have many thanks to give. Thank you. What a fabulous first half we have enjoyed. Um, there are many people to thank for making this evening the wonderful success that we're in the middle of. I'd like to thank these people on behalf of all of us enjoying such wonderful music making. First and foremost, I would like to express our indebtedness to Peter and Carmen Farah and their family. Peter... Words are certainly not enough, Peter. Um, we've talked about the meaning behind, uh, behind his gift. As you will have read, the console is dedicated to his father, the Reverend Shafiq, Canon Shafiq Farah, um, who was a priest both in Palestine and in the Diocese of Toronto. He performed the wedding ceremony of Peter and Carmen right, right here, um, where the console is standing now. And if I may, Peter, I understand that this is a gift made both in memory of a dear father and to perpetuate the values that your father embodied and espoused. Given in memory of a man whose life bridged two very different worlds, this dedication seems to embody a prayer that the music which is created from this console gives life to everybody who enters this building, wherever they have come from, whatever their nationality, faith, hopes, or dreams. It is for all of us here now and to feed the hearts of those yet to enter this building for generations to come. Music is a sign of the universality of God, of the world we inhabit, and of the significance of our relationships with each other. The beauty of the console, with Canon Shafiq's signature carved into the back of it, is a daily physical reminder of this truth, which I pray lives in every note which emanates from this console, from David's very first note this evening and forever. Thank you, Peter, Carmen, and all your family. It has been both a privilege and a genuine pleasure to get to know you all. Thank you. Thank you. It has also been a great pleasure to get to know the wonderful team from the Tourneau Organs, led by Andrew Forrest, the president of the Tourneau, and Tom Mitz, the owner. They have been supported by Guylaine Laplante, Francois Dandry, Dimitri Barrio, and Louis Dumay. They have lavished inordinate care and expertise and artistry on every step of a very complicated process to fashion what we think is one of the finest consoles in the land, and I think you will, will, will all agree. Um, it's a truly ex a wonderful example of how the latest in technology can be combined with something so exquisite that it would not be out of place in one of the museums or cathedrals um, in, in Europe. Um, I can think of Versailles, this might fit in, um, with its beautiful uh, oak tracery and cabinetry. So thank you so much to our friends from the Tourneau. As you can imagine, combining the latest in technological innovation with an instrument which has its origins 150 years ago has not been easy. In this respect, Letourneau organs have been most expertly helped by Gordon Mansell and his colleague, including Nico Campesi. Gordon, I cannot thank you enough for your care and attentiveness. 
The complexity of this operation has required me calling you at all hours. You have somehow managed to unravel wires and other con electrical conundrums which are completely beyond me at a moment's notice. Thank you so much for your help. Just a, a, a few more words of thanks. John Struve is our organ, organ technician and tuner at St. James, um, work he has carried out very ably for many years. In many ways, he's the unsung hero of this evening, and it's time to sing his praises. I'm not sure if John is here or not. Yes, John, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's probably spent years of his life wandering around the dusty corridors and back alleys of this instrument. Um, organs are deeply capricious, fickle little things. I should probably not speak ill of her right now, but pipes can whine and wheeze the moment the temperature rises or falls a degree or two and go on strike just as soon as a, a big packed cathedral is about to have a, a big diocesan service. And it's only due to John's wonderful um, experience and expertise that this instrument sounds as well as it does. Thank you so much. The, the Royal Canadian College of Organists have most generously sponsored this um, tonight's concert and a public word of genuine appreciation for all that this very special organization does to bring organists together and lovers of organ music and everybody interested in the art. By its very nature, organ playing, sitting on the bench for endless hours, can be a rather solitary profession and the support of the RCCO creates much needed um, community. Please do join the organization. We, we'd love to hear from you. Um, tomorrow morning at 10.30, there's a, a Meet the Console event, and um, you can um, play it and um, see all the wonderful, wonderful wizardry that happens here. I know we're here just for the music, which is going to start just in a second, but just before I hand the mic back to the prodigiously talented hands of the star of the evening, David, a word or two about the organ itself. As you know, it's a much-loved treasure. Um, and it, 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 we need to care for this um, gem of instrument well. But uh, John is doing this single-handedly, looking after 5,001 pipes, and there's only so much he can do. Much of the instrument's not received any significant um, attention since 1936, and like any octogenarian, she is in need of some love and attention. A significant planned restoration is needed so that it not only survives intact, but that the colors of the instrument sound as the builder, builders intended. The organ is rather like an antique masterpiece, longing for a thorough cleaning to be restored to its true original intent. Details about the work, what needs to be repaired and what needs to be cleaned and so on, will be talked about in due course. But for now, I'd be most grateful if you could keep in touch with us. Um, as lovers of music and of St. James Cathedral, your inv involvement is critical to this um, next stage. There have been many people to thank, and thank you for your patience. But back to where we started, the fact that there have been so many people to thank is in spirit of um, Peter's gift. This is a communal enterprise, and we're all part of the music making, whether it's in the, the micro or macro sense of the word. It's fabulous, simply fabulous to see you all here. Thank you so much for your part. The music would just not be as, as, as so much loved to an empty cathedral as it is. You are an integral part of this tonight's concert. And so thank you again. And now back to the man who makes this all happen, the, the maestro, the musician, the magician, our own David Briggs. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, uh, playing the Wagner on this organ was a very emotional experience for me. I mean, what a piece, but it's just amazing on this instrument with the surround sound effect. And I don't know about you, but I believe <clears throat> that the organ has the capacity to touch the human spirit like no other instrument. It's just wonderful. It's, somehow it gets into the, into the into the veins and uh, I suppose my lifetime job is to 
win as many new people over to this incredible instrument as, as possible. Um, and I remember doing that here in St. James with uh, some friends of ours who, who'd never heard an organ before. And, well, it was, they just needed to be picked up off the floor afterwards. We came in here after, after dark and uh, they had no idea about the sound, the wonder of the architecture and so on. So it's really a, a beautiful thing and I, I, I really commend this restoration to you with all my heart. Uh, it's um, really a great part of the Canadian heritage, this organ, uh, one of the most beautiful organs in Canada without any shadow of doubt. So I love to improvise ever since I was six years old. This is really, I mean, there's nothing special about it. It's, it's kind of, for me, real music making because you're not interpreting anybody else's thoughts. Um, you're creating music in a, an ephemeral way. Uh, although I said that word in Nashville last week and the, the, the lady who reviewed the concert said my improvisation was like a funeral. I didn't say funeral, I said ephemeral. But that's just... <laughs> um, and it certainly wasn't like a funeral. But what I love to do is improvise in fairly clear structures. So it's a little bit like a priest coming to the pulpit and speaking about a subject about which he's very passionate about, knows intimately for many years, has uh, a good command of syntax and grammar. And we all know, I think, that, that very often a gifted orator is more persuasive when he's not reading the text, when he's just communicating um, completely directly with, with, with the audience. So I think it was Benjamin Britten who said about music, it's an equilateral triangle. You have the composer, the performer, and the audience. And you take one of those ingredients away and the thing doesn't work. So I, th I think that's particularly true with improvisation. The role of the audience is, is very pivotal, I think. Uh, and saying that, thank you for listening so beautifully in the, in the first half. So here is uh, an improvisation. It's going to last probably 15, 20 minutes, something like that. If I was to compose this at home or on a plane or in an airport lounge or in a hotel room, this would take about um, two months to write. As it is, 15, 16, 17 minutes and it's gone forever. It's spontaneous. Um, it's going to be based on four different themes, which I'll play completely without any um, surrounding harmonies uh, at the beginning. And um, actually, I had the great fortune to study this art in Paris in 1985 and 86. And my teacher, Jean Langlais, who was a beautiful uh, improviser, um, a blind organist, absolutely phenomenal teacher, he was the sort of guy who had this hearing where if you played an improvisation that lasted 90 seconds or two minutes, he could get on the organ bench and just play it right back to you. It was, I never met anybody else who could do that. He also maintained that improvising in public <clears throat> is the same as sitting at the console without um, any clothes on. <laughs> so I've had a word with the uh, photographer and um, uh, we're going we're gonna to bring a screen here just to... I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody. <laughs> um, so um, here it is. After the concert, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a bunch of CDs available at the back, and I'd be very, very happy to sign anything you put into my hand. They're $20 each or four for 60 Last week, I was playing a, a, this concert in Nashville. This guy comes up to me afterwards and said, gee, that was such a great concert. Dr. Briggs, it's such an honor to meet you after all these years. I said, thank you very much. Very nice to meet you too. Could you sign one of my CDs? Of course, sir, great pleasure. Plastic bag, out comes the first CD. Elvis Presley. <laughs> <clears throat> this happened. He, and I said, well, do you want me to sign this Elvis Presley or David Briggs? Oh, David Briggs, it's such an Colossal honor to meet you after I've been like following your work for the last 40 years. It's so so cool to meet you David Briggs on the back. Out comes CD number two 
you guessed it, Elvis Presley. Pink jacket, guitar, the works. I signed it dutifully, David Briggs. CD number three comes out. I notice on the back of the CD that in the 1960s, Elvis had a keyboard player in his band called David Briggs. <laughs> Did I have the humility to tell him I was not that David Briggs? Uh-uh. I just said, perhaps you'd like to buy another 10 of my CDs, sir, and I'll, I'll sign them David Briggs. Um, so I, I'd be happy to um, sign it David Briggs or Elvis Presley, whatever you like.
David, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for, for, for coming back to St. James. Uh, um, it's been an absolutely phenomenal evening. We've all been very privileged to be here. Thank you for your phenomenal talent, your generosity, your creativity, your imagination, your wonderful stories. Um, I, I think we should not allow David to take any CDs back all the way to New York and he'll sign them however you wish. So, so, so do, do, do please have one. Thank you very, very, very much for all you've given us this evening.